back in the sports dome. Professional boxing has been losing fans to UFC and the WWE for years, but this weekend all eyes will be on the sweet science when Evander Holyfield boxes a horse for the WBA Heavyweight Championship. Promoters are betting the Philly feud will be one of the biggest fights in decades as Holyfield and the horse go 12 rounds hands to hooves. Evander the real deal Holyfield. A horse with nothing left to lose. Redemption waits in the ring. Holyfield versus Evening Dream at the Bellagio. Break out those envelopes you like to reseal and let's head to the steam room. You're in the steam room where we steam clean the stain of deception from the carpet of sports. Alongside OSN boxing analyst Adam Brannigan, I'm Tim Devannon. Adam, breathe deeply and hold the steam in your lungs. All right. The steam room begins now. Boxing has tried everything to recapture the fans. Reality shows, D-list celebrity matchups. What makes this match so different? There's so much on the line here. All the doctors have told Holyfield to retire. Right. Nobody wants to fight the guy. What does he do? Boom. He takes on an animal four times the size of a man. Right, but Holyfield has called Evening Dream a worthy opponent and, quote, one tough horse. But his manager had this to say at the weigh-in. Look, Evening Dream's a nice man. But you get in the ring with the big boys, you better be ready to get hurt. The man is going to kill that horse. That horse is dead. With all this bad blood, is the fight going to live up to the hype? Oh, definitely. This is exciting. Exactly what boxing is all about. You think so? Two men, or one man and one horse, or one man and two men riding in on a horse, settling their differences in the ring like men and horses. All right, but what about the critics who say Holyfield should hang up the gloves and retire from boxing for good? What do you Holyfield say? Holyfield is in the best shape of his life. Okay. This guy's training six hours a day, right. jumping rope, nice. even sparring with a Holstein cow named Tiffany, who, by the way, is a great boxer in her own right. All right, Brandon, it's time for the final sweat. You will most likely die from the steam. We shall see. You're Evander Holyfield. What's your game plan to knock this horse out? Realistically, Holyfield's only going to be able to punch that horse once before it goes totally berserk. And then when it's thrashing around in the ring, right. he's got to punch that horse right in the neck and face and keep on punching and punching and punching until it dies. That's how you beat a horse. All right, now the early rumors have the winner taking on Dylan the Lion with the belt on the line. Thoughts? Uh, it's about time. I mean, how many people does that lion have to eat before it earns a title shot? Adam Brannigan, there's a doctor waiting for you backstage to make sure you suffered no ill effects from the steam room. I'll go see him right now. Those guys are going to smell like steam for days. But coming up, Tiger Woods and Roger Federer frolic around on the set of the new Gillette Razor commercial. That horse is going to learn a valuable lesson in getting hit. It better pray to whatever horse got it believes it. NASCAR fans across the country are gearing up for tomorrow's Sears Classic 500, one of the biggest racing events of the year. Here to talk about some of the strategies we'll see in the race is legendary NASCAR coach Dan Amon. Mr. Amon, let me just say it's an honor to be speaking with you. Rarely do you get a chance to sit down with someone who knows so much about NASCAR. Tomorrow is your fifth Sears Classic. You're coaching Curtis Rutherford. What's your plan of attack? Well, the most important point is to drive fast. Now, what's the training regimen like to get a driver prepared to go fast? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, we do a lot of training with pedals. Pushing the pedal down all the way, that's very important. Now, a lot of mistakes uh, a lot of rookie drivers make is they only push the pedal down part way. We have some videotape, and I'd like to explain exactly what's going on here, because this is absolutely intriguing. What's happening here? OK, well, let's take a look. All right, now, now pause it right here. Now, he's turning left here. Yep. Now, if he turns left here, he'll go into this little grassy area right. here. Now, that's not allowed. Then if he turns right uh -huh. here, right. you got it. He's going to go into the wall here, and all the other cars behind him, they're going to pass him, and they're going to win the race, and he's going to lose. Now, uh, that ain't good. NASCAR tracks are circular, right? Well, that's a common misconception. They're actually ovals. Now, if they were circular, and there'd be no place on the track where they could go straight. You know, it'd just be this instead of this. Turning left, then going straight. Turning left, and then going straight. Coach, there are other cars on the track, of course. How do you handle them? What's the strategy there? Well, I always tell my drivers the same thing. I mean, look out the windshield. If you see a race car over there, don't drive into that place because if, you know, you might could hit them and it might cause an accident. Well, this is why you're the best. I mean, you really know your sport. Now, we have some tape here of the headset communication between you and Curtis Rutherford from last year's Sears Classic. Can we play that? Oh, that was a good one. Coming up on the turn. Don't turn yet. Don't turn yet. I'm not turning yet. He's ready to turn, but not yet. Ready? All right, here it comes. And turn left. Turn left. Turn left. Turn left. Keep turning left. Turn left. Keep turning left. Turn left. Okay, go straight. 
Wow, what a rare treat to get an inside glimpse into the world of NASCAR strategy. Coach, it was great to be talking with you this morning, and good luck tomorrow. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Let's turn to donkey basketball news. Today, Scraps, a two-year-old mammoth jack donkey from Lawrence, Kansas, who has played just five fundraisers, has been tapped by scouts to move directly up to Class A Midwest Donkey Basketball League play. This morning, he was signed by Dairyland Donkey Ball for a record 50 pounds of feed corn per day. Senior Onion News Network sports analyst Reggie Greengrass joins us now to fill us in on this donkey Scraps. Reggie, how good is Scraps? Michael, Scraps is one of the best players to come along in donkey basketball in a long, long time. He rarely bucks, he never flinches at balls thrown to his rider, and he has an innate ability to always trot towards the right basket. He's only 15 months old, is it's, that right? It's unbelievable. When the cameras start flashing, you know, most donkeys become confused, they'll lie down, they'll run out of the gym. Scraps has never done that. But does he have the maturity level? Because he's used to 4-H fundraisers, one-off tournaments, That's now right. he's going to be playing in front of crowds of, say, Two, three hundred people. Absolutely. And we've seen what can happen when a young, gifted donkey is suddenly thrust into that spotlight. Well, sure. I mean, just two years ago, of course, there was nubbins. nubbins. Sad story. He signs on to play in the big leagues, but he's not ready mentally. He refuses to eat, drops 10 pounds, he ends up tethered to a trailer out back, and of course, now he's in a petting zoo in Branson. Well, do you think Scraps can avoid going down that path? Michael, I spoke with legendary Dairyland coach Johnny Cordcom Bennett this morning. He says he's got a plan to keep Scraps on the straight and narrow. He's going to have him training with the team, but he's also going to have him stabled with them. That way, he becomes accustomed to their smell. When they actually hit the court, he won't be as skittish. And this just isn't any team we're talking about here. For oh, most people, no. Dairyland, Donkey Ball, is donkey basketball. You got that right. He, uh, it's the kind of break most donkeys would dream about if they dreamt at all. And he'll be playing alongside Hee Haw, Mr. Fred. You said it. That's thrilling for a young Jack. Oh, yeah. Sounds like uh, you're sold on Scraps. I am absolutely sold, Michael. Once you've seen Scraps play live, you know he's the real deal. I had the chance to do so last week, and I was in absolute awe of this donkey's moves. And hey, I, I've seen a lot of donkeys move, Michael. Yes, you have. Okay, Thank you, Michael. Reggie. We'll be keeping our eye on Scraps. Speculation is over. Wisconsin resident and Packers fan Chris Lukowski has announced that he will return to drinking for another football season. Following his wife's off-season threat to leave him if he didn't get help, many expected Lukowski to give up drinking for good. But he held a press conference today to announce he's not done yet. The Packers are my life, and drinking is my life. I think I have another couple thousand beers left in me. Can Lukowski push through with another good season, or are his best drinking days behind him? If you're going to need something in the next two minutes, please grab it now, because you will be unable to find it once you have entered the steam room. Welcome to the Steam Room. I'm Tim Devan, and alongside OSN sports analyst Marcus Kelly. Marcus, there is no I in Steam. I know that, Tim. Then the Steam Room begins now. Marcus, no question in anybody's mind that Chris Lukowski is among the all-time greats of alcohol consumption. Absolutely What's right. What's he got left to prove? Well, quite simply nothing, Tim. The guy's done it all. Lost right. jobs, destroyed property, all in the name of Packers football. Right. And his lifetime stats are incomparable. A .43 career high blood alcohol content right. and six women punched. The man just flat out loves to drink. That's right. We got some footage of him from a 2005 Packers victory. Let's take a look. Go, Pack! Go! Go, Pack! Go! Go, Pack! Go! I remember that game. He was a monster. That's right. He's really the last man standing from that incredible drinking class of 1974. Those were a great group of drinkers. Now, Lukowski never drank as much as Brian Pardville yeah, in one sitting, Yeah, Pardville now? He's All right. in an AA meeting getting his five-year sober chip. Lukowski's still sitting in front of his TV, drinking his weight in beer week right. after week. Can he keep up this high level of play? Of He's course he can. He's a far cry from the 97 Lukowski, who we all knew and loved, who celebrated the, the Packers Super Bowl victory by falling face first into his backyard barbecue and then being unable to remember why he had grill marks on his face the so next look, day. Look, let me tell you, the man has got good form and he's been drinking straight through the off season. Just, Just last Thanksgiving, that. he awkwardly broke his son's 14-year-old girlfriend right. and then threatened to kill himself by jumping off the roof of their ranch wow. house. It's time for the final sweat. I'm a little bit worried about you. Well, your concern is insulting. Very well. Chris mm -hmm. Lukowski's mm -hmm. time on this earth is limited. Who's the future of drinking? 
is I wouldn't look any further than the Lakowski household. Wow. Alex Lakowski has shown a tremendous potential for drinking since age three when his father poured beer in his bottle to keep him quiet during the game. And he's already accomplished so much at such a young age. That's showing right, he up has. wasted out of his mind for his job at Gumby's Pizza. Absolutely. Losing his tooth in somebody's milkshake and routinely peeing. He's what? got the best coach there That's is. Incredible. If the Packers are still playing, this kid will be drinking. He's got a real future. Marcus Kelly, I can't tell if we've survived the steam room or died and gone to some sort of warm, steamy purgatory. Either way, it's been an honor, Tim. Thanks, guys. You will live forever in our steamy memories. Moving on, the Milwaukee Brewers Polish sausage has admitted to steroid use and sausage race fixing. I'm still willing to do whatever it takes to drink. Right now, getting blackout drunk is the only thing that keeps me feeling happy and fulfilled. Right now, news from the International CPAC Takraw League. Bad boy Nguyen T. Butch Tui is grabbing headlines once again. The Chonburi Tigers have announced that they have suspended Tui a record fifth time this season, citing his public criticism of coach Ha Tong Lap for not running the offense through him more. Once again, here are those controversial comments from Tui. I am the best player on my team. Just give me the damn CPAC Takraw ball. We've heard that before, and joining us now is Senior Onion News Network sports analyst Reggie Greengrass. Tui just can't stay out of trouble, It certainly he? seems that way, Michael. Don't give me the damn Suffolk to craw ball. I mean, come on, doesn't Tui get the ball as much, if not more, than any other to craw in the league? It's unbelievable, Michael. I mean, Tui touches Raton on 85% of the Tigers' volleys, okay? Right. He's I mean, earned the on. attention. He's got a roll spike rate of 93, but... He's asking for more. 93 is great. What does he want? Now look, when you're in your 13.1 by 6.4, you've got to be thinking in terms of your regular. Yeah. This season alone, Tui's cautionable offenses include entering the court without the technical delegate's permission. I love that. Showing dissent through word or action and leaving the court without the permission of the technical delegate. How does he get away with this? Coach Lapp tried to instill some discipline. He moved Tui from the service circle to the quarter circle. We both know that's not an easy decision to make with a King's Cup on the line. Michael, this guy basically thinks of himself is the god Hanuman, you know, yeah. playing Takra on a group of monkeys that, like in the mural at Wet Rock Cow. <laughs> Big picture, is Tui good for Sepik Takra? Well, listen, interest in the sport has never been higher, mm -hmm. but is it for the right reasons? I mean, do we want to talk about his regu substitution pattern or the yeah. fact that he's dating the Hatai Lekbam Rao? Yeah, I'm jealous. Well, he's already had a tremendous effect on the rest of the league. Absolutely. Other Takras are not as vocal as Tui, mm -hmm. but they are signing three trillion bot deals, releasing their own Luff Tongue albums. Their faces are all over our Thai bean custard containers. That's for sure. Yet, many of these guys can't even wait around after a match to sign Rattans on the pitch. Mm -hmm. I think Sepik Takraw is going to have to take a long, hard look at itself if it wants to keep relating to the average fan. You bet. Reggie Greengrass, thank you for your time, sir. My pleasure. We'll talk to you again. Well, it looks like fencing's bad boy, Raphael Delacroix, has run afoul of the law yet again. Police in Monaco have issued a warrant for Delacroix's arrest in connection with a cat burglary of a priceless diamond from the Prince Rainier Museum. Just another black mark for a man who's fast becoming a poster child for bad behavior in fencing. Will the International Fencing Federation finally do something about Delacroix, or will he get off scot-free once more? Break out your lobster bib, because somebody's about to get steamed. Welcome to the Steam Room, where we sweat the truth out of our experts. Alongside Reggie Greengrass, I'm Tim Devannon. Reggie, you ready to swallow some hot steam? The wetter, the better. Then the Steam Room begins now. Red stealing the Monaco diamond. Come on, Delacroix, sure, he's got a lightning-quick parry. But how can the IFF let this skullduggery go unpunished? I hear you, Tim. And Delacroix's got to answer for dropping that crystal chandelier on those museum guards. He hasn't taken responsibility for any of it yet. In fact, just this afternoon, he released a statement saying, Me, Le Jaguar, preposterous. Perhaps if the police weren't such bumbling fools, they'd be able to catch this man and clear my good name. You buying that? Come on. Delacroix is clearly Le Jaguar. Uh -huh. How many six-foot-one men with pencil mustaches can there be who move with the grace and power of a jungle cat? Right. For all the villainy, there's no denying he's still Da Vinci with the sword. Sure, but lately his kool has been overshadowed a little bit by his hot dog and off the floor. Well, no question. His behavior just keeps getting worse. Police searched his car during a routine stop. Uh -huh. They found a priceless Rembrandt that they traced to a daring heist at the Louvre. Really? Of course, Delacroix said it belonged to a friend. Oh, yeah, right. The league let him off with a fine. What is IFF Commissioner Peter James Whistleby waiting for? What, Delacroix to kidnap a rare white tiger from the Artis Royal Zoo? It's true, yes. He spends too much time giving out roses to young widowed socialites in the stands and not enough time deflecting 
his opponents to tackle fair. Widows whom he widowed, no doubt. Yeah, and this week, he seduced, married, and divorced Countess Stefania Isabella de Uster of Switzerland, made off with 50 million in Nazi gold in a locket that was owned by Catherine the Great. Scoundrel! The Countess spoke to OSN's Under the Bleachers about that incident. He told me that I was his true love, that I had tamed him. And then he left with my royal coronet while I was sleeping. I still love you, Le Chacois. I forgive you. Poor sad lady. Reg, it's time for the final sweat. You are dehydrated and dangerously low on electrolytes. Are you sure you can handle more heat? I demand it. Here it comes. Is there no one who can bring an end to this dashing knave's reign of terror? I will, Tim. No, it's too dangerous. I have no choice but to take up the boy once again and vanquish this rape. Well, Godspeed, Reggie Greengrass. You survived the steam room. Go rehydrate. Well steamed, guys. When we come back, sports music researchers have discovered a brand new jock jam to pump up the nation. Stick around. Those lips, those lips that spoke such sweet lies to me. I could not resist because you know I'm a woman and there's nothing you can do when you meet Le Jaguar. It just, it takes your heart away and there's nothing you can do. I love him.